good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I am your podcast host, Danny Vicent, and this is Coffee and Conversations, a place where we explore topics in technology, leadership, and innovation, discussions about things that are keeping you up at night with industry experts, technology experts, and so much more. So grab your cup of coffee and join us as we dive in. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Thank you for joining another episode of Coffee and Conversation. Uh, And as you guys know, because I say it every time we do a podcast in this industry, I get really excited when we talk about education. Uh, And if you've missed any of our other education podcasts, please click the link right here. Uh, There's a listing to all of them. I would recommend going back and listening to them because uh, they're pretty fantastic. In fact, um, one of my greatest pleasures on this podcast is when somebody spends an hour with me and then decides they had so much fun they come back for a second round. So one of these voices you're going to rec- you're going to recognize real quick, but I did bring two other experts on as well and we're going to let them introduce themselves now. So we'll start with that familiar voice and then we'll jump into the newbies. Mary, would you like to say hello to the audience once again? Yes, thank you Danny and hello everyone. Mary Sluggelmelk and I lead the US public sector education um, mostly focusing on K12. What's my background? I come into Cisco as an educator, been here 13 years. But I have experience in teaching, of course, administration, district administration, and as well as adjunct faculty at a couple of universities. So education is my passion, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here at Cisco for my tenure that I've been here because I continue to really help school districts and help universities all over really think about what is the role of technology in education. So good to be back with you again, Danny. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Rob, why don't we go to you next? Introduce the folks to who you are. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for the invite today. Uh, My name is Rob Paris. I'm the engineering director for what we call SLED East at Cisco. And what SLED East is, is I have all the engineers reporting to me for state and local government in all education, which is K through 12 and higher ed, covering about 25 states in the U.S. So education is a passion of mine. Um, been dedicated to education for the last three years at Cisco, but I've you know, worked in some form of education all 24 years I've been at Cisco. So education means a lot. It also means a lot personally. I have two kids, one in middle school, one in high school. So you know, education not only is something I do for my day job, but it also means a lot when I come home at night. So happy to be here, happy to talk about technology and education. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, Rob. Brad, how about, how about you introduce the audience to who you are? Yeah, really glad to be here. Um, So Brad Saffer, I'm the Global Education Lead for Cisco's Industry Solutions Group. Uh, We're responsible for developing and executing our global strategy in education. Um, That includes driving thought leadership, uh, making sure that the uh, requirements from the market globally are baked into uh, Cisco products. Uh, We do a lot of sales enablement. Um, and I've been in the role for just about four years, but I've been in education for 25 years. In fact, I started my career as a teacher and coach, um, and I awesome. continue to be a teacher and coach for my two high school uh, boys. Um, but uh, I'm really passionate about education uh, and really helping uh, teachers and students be successful. So really happy to be here today. Awesome. Brad, thank, thank you for joining us today. Um, I, I want to jump into something because Mary, I know you and Rob attended a conference recently um, and education, the landscape of education is changing very rapidly with the introduction of AI. And I know that was a hot topic over there. So I want to sort of ask you both, um, tell us a little bit about that conference, what struck you about it and, and, and what are some of the challenges we're seeing and how we're addressing those? Yeah, so we both attended the ISTE conference in June, which is in Philadelphia, and ISTE is the International Society for Technology and Education. And it truly is an international show with people coming from all over the world, um, but mostly primarily United States educators, administrators. And, you know, AI was a huge piece of the conversation. And I, and I kept thinking to myself, at Cisco, we've been doing AI for years. It's, it's really baked into our network. It's baked into security. And what I love is AI, artificial intelligence, is really part of our collaborative platform. That's what's fueling WebEx assistance. That's what's fueling that ability to transcribe, translate, take notes during a meeting all, all automatically. And so when I think about AI, I really think about the technology more than just a generative search tool that's giving 
that information back to, you know, whomever is looking for that information. So it's more than chat GPT. And that's what I'm excited about is now it's time for us to, to think differently about how can AI truly help educators? And I'm thinking beyond just a chat GPT type of application. Rob, how, how about you? How, how, did, how did the conference affect you? Yeah, it was a great conference and AI was everywhere. I mean, that's all people seem to be talking about. I, I mean, I attended a ton of sessions and the ones that had AI in the title, the line was out the door. But I think what AI means for me is a lot of people think of AI as ChatGPT or Bard for Google. I know my kids use it to help them maybe with a, a homework assignment. But really for Cisco, AI is a lot more. And what Mary touched upon is we've been doing AI for years. We didn't call it AI. Maybe we called it things like self-healing network or whatever it might be. But really the root of all of our products are based in AI. And I think where this really matters with my customers that I talk to in education is security is always a hot topic. And I think every school I meet with, you know, they, the, the two things that come up are, I'm worried about ransomware and how do I create this zero trust environment so I can bring, so my students can bring anything into the school and I know it's secure. And, you know, so what Cisco has been doing over the years is we've embedded this into all of our products, but now we're accelerating it. One fact about Cisco that some people know, but usually when I talk to people about this, is we have one of the largest threat intelligence organizations called Talos and Cisco. And what Talos provides, they see about 40% of the internet traffic. And why that's important for AI and how it relates back is, is by being able to see all this, we can feed this information into all of our products, not just a firewall, not just a switch, end-to-end -end Cisco network and react quickly. That's how we're able to use AI in the network to stop security threats and to make, you know, the school environment a safer environment, especially now with what COVID showed us, the ability where students want to learn from everywhere. So there's a lot more learning at home. There's a lot more cloud. So now using Cisco technologies with our AI basis, we're able to secure you anywhere you are, home, school, coffee shop, playground, we're able to secure it. So that's really you know, what, what I got from the show and really how I think, you know, what, what I see with Cisco and AI moving into the future. I love that. Uh, and, and folks, uh, as usual on the podcast, there are a plethora of links down below. So, so both Rob and Mary have touched on a bunch of hot topics. Please visit those links below. There'll be a lot of information on those. And as always, if you have any questions, uh, please submit those into the Ask Us Anything down below as well. Uh, and then I'll go around Robin and we'll just keep these guys busy all day long with all of your questions. Um, Brad, uh, now I know, uh, I don't know if you attended the conference or not. I don't, I don't believe you did, but I'm sure we're seeing a lot of AI trends within Cisco itself. So I'd love to get your perspective on what we're seeing there uh, from our, our view. Yeah, so um, just to take a step back, if you look globally right now, there is, you know, a lot of concern about AI because there's just so much that's unknown and people don't really understand, you know, what it is and, and where, where it exists, right? So as Mary and, and Rob pointed out, yeah, everyone's just thinking it's chat GPT, it's, you know, large language models, all that stuff. Um, and as a result, we're seeing, you know, governments starting to try to figure out how they're going to put some safeguards in. Right now, so the, uh, the European Union, for example, uh, just drafted legislation called the AI Act. They're kind of ahead of the curve in terms of actual legislation that puts some guardrails uh, and some principles in place around AI. And then just last week, uh, several large tech companies met with the Biden administration in the US and, and agreed to follow some guidelines that they worked out together. So we're, we're in sort of the self-policing stage here, right? So, so We've got that side of it, but the bottom line is that AI is, it's, it's very pervasive and in fact, you know, it's being promoted, right? So it's an, it's an interesting dichotomy and I think where we're seeing, in addition to, you know, AI in our products, a lot of our partners are using AI in ways that are, are benefiting uh, students. So, you know, around behavior analytics or, or predictive analytics or chatbots that can help with administrative tasks. So the, the irony here, and, and you know, there's probably, it's, we'll see kind of a, a differentiation of, of the types of uses and where the concerns uh, exist, but um, you know, it's, it's well, it's much more pervasive than people think right now, and it's only gonna continue, because uh, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. Yeah, for sure. 
And, and I, I'm going to double down with you, Brad, because uh, I'm, I'm curious if we have a lot of examples or examples that we can share. You know, we, we talk about AI, but I would imagine to have a, a, a something with AI running smoothly, you have to concern yourself with your collaborative tools. You have to concern yourself with your network. As Rob said, you have to concern yourself with your security. So what are some examples we can share that, that showcase that in a good light? Yeah, so again, I'll go back to some of our partners. Um, Degree Analytics is one that that does predictive analytics. They're using uh, AI in their uh, you know in in their software. Um, Maze Map is another. They're a, they're a wayfinding application, right, to help students find the best path to campus. They're using artificial intelligence, and then we have other you know many many other partners uh, as well. But those are two two examples of uh, of where AI is being used and directly impacting the campus experience. I love that. Folks, I'm going to remind you once again, please click, click those links down below and get your questions in. Um, as these folks are uh, talking, I'm sure questions are popping up. God knows they are for me. So if you get those in, we'll get them answered as quickly as possible. Uh, so Mary, I, I'm going to ask how, how this is affecting our hybrid classroom. I know we talked about that in our last podcast together, um, but I want to discuss how these things are affecting that and how we're getting to the students where they are. Yeah, I think this is really what, um, you know, as we want to reimagine education coming post pandemic, we're, we're really starting to reevaluate that industrial model of education and how can we truly use technology in the classroom to help our teachers, to help our teachers know where students are, to personalize the learning experience for students. And this is where AI can truly be part of that network in which it's looking into the various applications and knowing where students are and within their curriculum, within their learning process, and then give the teachers that, that just-in-time report to say, hey, we need to cohort students and move them forward or cohort certain students and you know do some redirection to, to make sure that they're moving forward. So I think that um, you know it's a time for us to to think differently as we reimagine education and not just use technology as that that piece in the classroom that is an add-on, but truly to help drive the learning process and to help teachers do what they do best is to teach students and to enable the learning environment, not so much to just um, you know be a gatekeeper and to keep students on a grade or a age level type of um, scenario like the industrial model of teaching and learning has traditionally been. I, I, I love that, Mary. And I know we had a long conversation about that in the last podcast. So I'm going to remind folks, if you didn't listen to that one, please click that link and listen through it because it was fantastic. And, and, and you know, Mary, you touched on something there that, that, that triggers something in my head. And Rob, you sort of touched on this earlier, and that's I have kids. And so when kids are learning and you're at home and you're accessing education in a different method, um, obviously we wanna make sure that's secure. We don't want something coming through that that, that shouldn't be there. And, and what are we doing in that in that part of that, uh, part of the spectrum if you will? Rob, do you wanna take that one? I'll take that. So what well, I think what the pandemic showed us is there's no physical walls of classrooms anymore. So students learn at home, students learn in the classroom, students learn at friends' houses, wherever. So what we're doing at Cisco is we are embedding security in every aspect of the network. We talked about how AI is keep making sure we're not getting hit with ransomware, but it's more than that. It's the whole zero trust philosophy. And you know, zero trust from a student perspective is how can they join with any device? Maybe it's their school Chromebook, maybe it's their home PC, maybe they're maybe they're trying to game with kids and doing esports, whatever it might be, how do we create that environment and make it secure? And that's really we, we're, where we are with Cisco today and where we're making it better. And the, the idea is, is that we don't want technology to hamper the students learning. So I think in the past, when people thought of IT, is they thought of IT was the person who took your computer to get fixed. And now what I found, especially since the pandemic, is our IT leaders at our, at our schools are actually sitting at the table with the educators and they're brainstorming on ideas on how can we allow people to learn from anywhere and do it securely and protect them and you know make sure people aren't jumping into meetings they shouldn't jump into and things like that. I will say the only downfall, there's what is one downfall is, and my kids talk about it all the time, there's no more snow days. That's the only <laughs> downfall to this. I'll just say, I'll just stop right there. No more snow days. But other than that, it's amazing what we're able to do when we combine 
the education with the technology and bring it together. And that's that's what we're trying to do at Cisco. Yeah, so Rob, you can say that living in the Northeast, I can say it living here in Nebraska, no more snow days, right? Uh, but Brad, you know, he's in California. So yeah. what is their what is their excuse for, you know, weather well, events? We're, we're a little softer out here. So um, they've just eliminated what they used to call rain days. So, you know, they get sometimes <laughs> no more rain days. I love it. There's no way. Right. The kids are like, it's raining. Can I stay? And yeah. say, no. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, in the part of California I'm at, Rob, we don't even have the rain. So, you know, you never know. We just don't have yeah. any days off. <laughs> We're done. Uh, so you're used to it, and you're used to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so something that we've mentioned on previous podcasts is inclusive learning for all. Um, and and I, I think we'd be remiss in not talking about how there has been a gap or a divide that's happened over the pandemic within that. Um, you know, and Brad, you were, you were touching on it a little bit earlier. So I'd love to talk about how we are addressing that gap that maybe the pandemic has caused within that learning and inclusive learning for all. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of public funding around the globe uh, dedicated to providing connectivity for all students. Um, Obviously, in the U.S., there were, um, you know, a lot of students from from rural, remote areas that uh, that didn't have access to technology. Um, even urban areas, same thing. Um, you know, students, um, disadvantaged students who just didn't have the connectivity that they needed to stay connected and to be part of remote learning during the pandemic. And this is an issue that's that's happening, uh, you know, around the globe. So again, governments are are continuing to provide. Uh, funding for that, um, you know, in addition to all the funding that we uh, we have in the, in the United States, um, Portugal is a country that is uh, working on a project to provide connectivity for all schools. Um, in Australia, New Zealand, they have a, uh, pro a program called the Regional Connectivity Program, which is designed to get internet access to uh, the Northwest Territories and students who are who are in remote locations. Um, so basically, you know, we've seen and we've been talking about the shift to digital and the shift to hybrid. And, you know, again, what that means differs depending on where you are, but, but there is some level of hybrid everywhere across the globe in schools. And so as a result, if you are not able to access digital services at home, you are disadvantaged. So um, we're seeing continued uh, amount of money in that space. And then Cisco is driving a lot of these, uh, a lot of these efforts. So we, we've been involved uh, um, in, in all the ones that I've mentioned above. Uh, we're working with uh, various states in, in Germany, for example, to, to increase connectivity um, that, is, that is equitable. Um, because at this point, that's kind of the, that's the first uh, critical need. You can't do any of the great things that, uh, that you wanna do around, around hybrid and, um, and, and doing personalized learning and increasing the flexibility uh, for students, teachers, parents, uh, without connectivity. So uh, we're, we're heavily invested in, in working directly with schools, districts, governments to, uh, to provide that connectivity around the globe. Oh, I love that. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember a time when computers were not uh, in every home. Right? They were never in mine. I was the last one on the block to have one in my house. And I remember how that felt and how my friends were doing things on the computer for school and, and advancing. And I felt like I was left out. I could not imagine that feeling now when oh. connectivity is paramount to learning. So I, I love to see that governments and Cisco is, is getting involved in, in helping that. Yeah, I, Mary, I know you have a lot of thoughts there. Oh, go ahead, Brett. Sorry, I, I, I wanted no. to mention one more thing that I forgot, which is um, we're also making investments in other technologies to provide that connectivity. So, for example, we're doing a lot around private 5G because oh, you know, Wi-Fi connectivity is it's difficult to get to certain certain places. So um, we're investing in pilot projects uh, to to prove that out um, and, and make that connectivity more reliable. So important to know that, you know, we're not just working on things uh, that are in our portfolio today, but we're really investing heavily uh, in the technologies of the future uh, to continue to to do a better job of addressing that need. Oh, that's 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 awesome, Brad. I'm, I thank you for interrupting me because that that is that is mm -hmm. awesome. 
Uh, Mary, I can see you chomping at the bit there. And so I want to come to you because I think you have some thoughts on this as well. Uh, and I'm not even going to ask you a question. I'm just going to let you free freestyle this one and, and jump in on that that topic. Well, let me let me shift this into another avenue in which we really do a lot of work in in our corporate social responsibility side of Cisco is the networking academies. Um, so as we think about bridging that digital divide, yes, the connectivity is really important, but we also want to make sure that we're growing the skills, um, the technical skills all over the world. And so one of the ways in which we can help do that is with the networking academies. Um, they're in high schools, they're in community colleges, they're in um, universities, they're in our prison systems. Um, we have a big um, push that we've helped the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities to um, install networking academies. Um, even in our libraries, um, Dallas, um, the, the Dallas community with the public libraries there of what is the networking academies and how can they help the community? And so that's where I'm always saying it's important for us to look at the skills and, and the networking skills, the cyber skills of the cybersecurity. Um, maybe it's the data analytics skills that are needed um, to really help grow the citizenry. You know, because digital skills are so important for everybody. I mean, that's how you get many of your services now. You pay your parking ticket online or you need to get a, a, a new driver's license. So these are some of those skills in which we, we want to continue. And so as we think about that, we're thinking about what are the basic skills, but then what are skills that are needed for a technical job that leads into what Rob and his team all do, you know? And so I, I think about that all the time is to become a Cisco engineer is, is really a fantastic feat. But I also look at many of the skills that are needed in our school districts, the IT departments in our schools, and how can our schools home grow their own IT department? And so, you know, Rob, you know a lot about, you know, the academies and things like that. You want to chime in here? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. So I just want to build off that a little bit. So during the pandemic, we saw a really big economic inequality with people having to, you know, either losing their jobs or working from home mm -hmm. and everything that Mary's talking about. I think Mary Network Academies have been around since 90, is that you? 92, 92, 97. And you know what? We'll have to look. Okay. That. But so we took that same concept and Cisco created something called Skills for All. And if you want to go to it, skillsforall.com. And what we've done is we've taken a lot of our Network Academy teachings and we opened it up to the world. So if you have a mobile device, you can access skillsforall.com and you can start to take technical training. And this technical training isn't Cisco specific. Some of it is, but I've taken courses on it. It's like intro to Python or things like that. And what this is allowing us to do is allowing us to fix two problems. One, you know, help people with that economic inequality, but also there's a lot of IT jobs out there that aren't filled, especially with the pandemic, people moved all around. I don't think I talked to a customer in my segment where they don't have a bunch of openings in IT. So what we're trying to do as Cisco is we're really trying to help there. You know, we want to train people to fill these jobs. A lot of states have even um, lessened the requirements where you don't need a college degree anymore. So just getting some of these serfs can get you a, a very good job, you know, and I have engineers on my team that have doesn't that all they have are serfs, no college degree. And, you know, so so Cisco is really enabling that. So, you know, skills for all is amazing to build off network academy. So we're really trying to help the world. And I, you know, at the at the conference Mary and I attended, I spoke to a woman who was trying to do this in countries like Uganda and Part, different mm -hmm. parts of Africa where, you know, Brad, to your point, where they're, if they can get network connectivity through 5G or whatever, and then they can have a program like Skills for All, we can really up-level society. So that's, you know, that's really what we're trying to do to help bridge this divide. Yeah, and what I'm excited about is the latest two new certifications that are out there. They're lifetime certs. So, you know, everybody knows of the acronym CCNA, which is a networking certification or CCSP, which is, you know, having to do with security. But now we have technical certifications that are lifetime certifications that are for those entry level jobs to be a help desk um, person or to do that basic level of networking, which we all need those people within our IT departments. 
So I'm super excited about those two new certifications that we have just released the curriculum for. And, and I just encourage every high school, every career in tech ed, and, and, I, and that's in my heart, Rears, um, is, is CTE programs, career and technical education programs, is thinking into the future of what do we need to home grow employees? Because many times we have, you know, we have people that want to stay within their communities, but they need a highly technical skill. And, and I think this, is, this helps them get on that road to those skills. You know, Mary, you said something there that I often talk to people about, and and that is, you know, everybody thinks of a field and they think of the, you know, if they think of tech, they think of the engineer. Mm -hmm. But there's so many roles that keep the cogs moving. And if you remove one, the whole thing stops. And so I love that you're you're talking about those roles that maybe people don't think about uh, every time. Now, Mary, I'm going to come straight to you because uh, I know you're prepared for this question and I asked you last time, but so you don't get to use the same answer. So it's going to be a challenge nonetheless. And then I'm coming to the other the rest of you as well. So you guys have a moment to think about this. But when you think about the future of education, what 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 do you see and what what is the future of education to you? Uh so I don't remember my last answer. So, <laughs> But, you know, as being an educator for over 35 years now, it's really something that I think the future of education is about creating those learning environments and having teachers that are highly qualified teachers that enable those learning environments so that students, no matter where they're at, have the ability to have a high quality education. So it doesn't matter if you're in the far reaches of rural areas or in you know very urban areas. The diversity that is around this world and the the knowledge that we have, and we we kind of went into this avenue of generative types of um, you know AI. We can now truly gain even more knowledge exponentially so fast, but we still need to have those relationships in a learning environment. And I, and I think it's really would behoove every educator to think, how can we move forward to really build those types of great learning environments? I, I love that. I love that. Brad, how about you? Yeah, so I, I want to first reflect on some of that previous conversation that Mary and Rob were having, because it's it, the context is important. Um, education, compared to a lot of other industries, has been pretty static for the last, you know, let's say 100 years, right? But I go back to the financial crisis in 2008, which was, was one of the inflection points that started to drive innovation, especially around nano degrees and credentials. So this is relevant to the conversation we were having about networking academy. And, you know, the question is, why, why did that start happening? Well, it's, it's because the static model wasn't delivering what it needed to the marketplace in terms of skills or to individuals. So that I think is a harbinger for what we need to continue to drive that sort of innovation uh, in order to, to do a better job of, of teaching students, giving them opportunities, and driving a more powerful world economy, okay, to put it on a grand scale. So when I think of what the future of education can and should be. It can really continue that. So we have one of the elements, and there's probably a million that I could list, but I'll, I'll just mention two. Um, so the access, so access for all. And it's not just about the digital divide that we've been talking about, but it's, it's availability of programs and content and personalized learning. So being able to learn the way is, that is best for you. For some students, that means sitting in a classroom. For other students, it means no not being distracted by a classroom and being on a screen, right? Um, some, some students learn better uh, by watching a video, others by reading, others listening to a podcast like this, um, which is going to be incredibly inspiring to, to everyone around the world, I want, I'm going to just say parenthetically. Um, so so that, that availability, right? Availability and access to all of those different opportunities is number one. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, you know, learning that is connected and inspires. And what I mean by that is we sometimes make uh, sort of have treated education as something you have to do, check a box and go on to the next thing without thinking about how am I going to really inspire students to find their passion? So when they go into when it's time for them to, to go into the, the workforce, they are, they're excited 
about what, what they're going to do. So I think helping them find the passion so they can pursue it. Um, and part of that is, is maybe creating better links to education and jobs and skills. And not, I'm not talking about, you know, career training specifically, but more like what's out there? What can my life be like? Because when you provide hope for students, that's a great motivator, right? We're always talking about how can we improve student engagement, student success. And if it comes from within, if it's self-motivated, uh, that's the best way to get, to get students to succeed. Um, and then I think the other part too around that is let's stop thinking about education as something you do and you finish and then you go on to work. Lifelong learning is really, really important. Uh, and when you look at the skills that are needed for jobs today, a lot of them, you know, we don't even know what the next uh, 10 years are gonna, uh, you know, bring. So we have to get into a mindset of learning being continuous, right? And so again, breaking down those barriers, there needs to be more fluidity between life and education. And so I think everything we've talked about today is trending in that uh, direction, uh, but there's a lot more work to do. Um, and uh, I'm just really excited that, that you know, Mary, Rob and I, and so many others at Cisco get to play such a positive role in making that happen. That was awesome, Brett. Thank you. That, I mean, that's definitely propelling us global. Uh, like you said earlier, this, this podcast is gonna go everywhere now. <laughs> Rob, how about you? What, what is the future of education? I mean, basically what Mary and Brad said. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know, but just to build off that, I'm not gonna, you know, I think the way I view education is, you know, more collaborative. I think in the past, education has been very, here's here's a curriculum, here's what you learn. And I think now it's about collaboration between faculty, between students, between parents, and helping develop that curriculum. I think, um, you know, going beyond the physical walls of the school. I think what technology has showed us during the pandemic is that, you know, students can learn from home, students can learn from anywhere. But more importantly, what, you know, we started to talk a little bit about hybrid classroom and what you can do in the classroom. Now it's also maybe even thinking about how do you bring the best educators to the students? So now you can kind of bridge that economic divide. So, you know, the school in the most rural area can maybe get someone to come in and talk about the most innovative things over video or whatever it might be. So to me, that's exciting. And then just, you know, how Brad talked about 5G and about kind of the digital divide. I hope, you know, three years from now, if we're on a podcast like this, that's not something we have to talk about. I mean, I hope we're able to enable and give everybody access to the internet because I think that's really the leveling factor. If you have access to the internet, you have access to technology, you have programs like Skills for All and networking academies and the hundreds of other programs out there, it gives every student a chance in the world to really achieve, you know, achieve whatever they want to achieve. So for me, that's really what I hope for education is that we can tear down any type of equity walls, any type of digital divide, and just really, you know, give everybody the same chance at a at an unbelievable education. Mm -hmm. You know what, I, I, and, and I've said this to Mary on the last podcast, but I love when you guys get passionate about a subject and the three of you talking about the future of education, that 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 was awesome. I, I, I enjoyed that brief moment for, for a lot. Uh, folks, I'm going to remind you again that there are some links down below as well as an Ask Us Anything. Please go visit those and get your questions and we will get back to you as quickly as possible. Um, we have reached the end of the podcast, uh, and if you've listened to any of my podcasts before, you know what's coming. And if you haven't, well, you're in for a surprise. Um, but uh, as we are leaving, I always ask, if there's one thing, one thing that, that you want our audience to know or to take away from this podcast, what is that one thing? And, and Mary, I'll come to you since you knew this question was coming. We'll start off with you. What's that one thing you'd like everybody to remember as they walk away? I think the biggest thing is that Cisco is more than a technology company. Cisco is an education company. We're rooted in education by the founders of Cisco. Um, we're in an educational environment and we really look at education as part of our core. And that's one of the reasons why our corporate social responsibility main focus has always been with networking academies and now with skills for all. And so we are more than just a technology company. I love that. Brad, how about that one thing for you? Yeah, I mean, I would have said exactly that. So um, uh, I guess the <laughs> only other thing, you know, I, I would add, I would add is that uh, we are doing all of the things that we've talked about on this podcast today. We are helping schools globally 
transition to hybrid. We are helping schools globally develop the networking and the connectivity necessary to be part of the digital world. Um, and we are providing the security that is critical to protecting data, personal information, uh, and, and ensuring that, uh, that everybody is, is safe from threats. So again, really proud to be a part of this team and, and to be driving uh, you know, this transformation around the globe that's so critical for, for all students. Very well said. Rob, how about you? One thing. First, Danny, thanks for putting this podcast together. You know, I think it, I think the topic was very relevant. For me, you know, I'll just end on, you know, I think technology is an enabler to level the playing field for education. I think, you know, technology is the key. Cisco is a big player in that. But I think really it's really technology can make it so we can really up level, you know, every learner, I won't even say student, every learner in the in the world with technology. So I would say, you know, embrace technology. Um, and, you know, anything we can do to help, we're here for you. That's awesome. Um, uh, I, guys, I, I, I'm very honest when I tell you this. I'm always honored when people give me an hour of their day. Uh, I'm sure your calendars are not easy to find an hour to carve out to talk to me and, and truly educate me in, in what you do every day. Um, and I feel if I can get educated, then I know something's out there for our audience as well. And so I, on behalf of the audience as my, and myself, I'd like to thank you. Uh, all for taking that hour with me um, and folks out there, please get your questions in that you didn't get answered or that just popped into your mind. The more questions you send me, the more likely I have brilliant people like this uh, join the podcast again in the future. Um, I really enjoy it. Thank you all. And we'll catch Thanks, you. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Danny. Appreciate it.